heard an awful lot about the Second Vatican Council, which is a natural transition to exploring the sacred liturgy, as you probably know. And it's great to be here with you. This uh, is a very new venue for me, I have to tell you. I've spoken in a lot of different places about our Catholic faith, and it's a great privilege. But the typical kind of places, you know, like churches, parish uh, meeting halls, conferences, retreats. This is the first time I've ever given a Catholic presentation in a bar. <laughs> At least as far as I can recall. <laughs> but, but I think that this is such a great idea because it's a very Catholic thing to do, I think. I, I was preparing for this talk and I couldn't help but think about an old neighbor of mine named Bruce who is a Southern Baptist guy. And in case you don't know, Southern Baptists don't drink. You know, not a drop. Not, not until they pull the shades anyway. And <laughs> he used to so love to say to me, well, you Catholics sure do love to drink. They, he used to say that. Over, and I couldn't argue because the man has a point, doesn't he? <laughs> and you know, why not? Why not? Jesus himself was a winemaker, wasn't he? If you think about it, we see it at the wedding feast of Cana. Now, he exercised some divine privilege. He didn't stomp grapes. He sped up the process, but he was a winemaker nonetheless. And us Catholics even have religious orders of brewmasters, don't we? We have Trappist monks in monasteries, craft really some of the finest beer in the world. You know, and we're the only ones that can make that claim. You can't go up to the bar tonight and get an Episcopalian Pilsner. <laughs> you can't. You can't get a Lutheran lager, but you can go to your local wine distributor, beer distributor, and order a case of Abbey Ale. You'll need a second mortgage to pay for it because it's expensive, <laughs> but you can do it. And so I think this is a great fit broth. It's a very Catholic thing to do. I also think it's a, a really concrete example of something that Father Matt talked about last week, about how our Catholic faith, and in particular Holy Mass, and that outpouring of grace that we receive there, how it's not really confined to that one hour on Sunday morning. It's really a calling. It's a sending forth into the world. And we carry our Catholic faith with us everywhere that we go. We take it to work. We take it to play. We take it to a place like this to enjoy the good fruits that God has given us on this earth, the good drink, the good food, the good company that we're going to share tonight. So I think this is a great example of what Father Matt spoke about last week. Now, how many of you were here for that talk last week? I'm curious. Very good. Roughly uh, about half of you. Well, I have to offer you my condolences because Father Matt is a tough act to follow. And if I ever do this again, I'm going first because I'll make both of us look better. Now, I know that Father Matt shared with you last week the fact that this coming fall, we're going to see some changes in the way that we celebrate Holy Mass. Now, to be more specific, the Mass isn't changing, but some of the words that we use, some of our prayers and responses are going to change because we're anticipating a new English translation of the Roman Missal. And just in case you're not entirely clear, the Roman Missal is that big book that contains the sacred text and directions for the ritual actions that we use in the celebration of Holy Mass. Now we're going to implement a new edition of the Roman Missal on November 27, 2011, the first Sunday of Advent this year. Now, here we are, it's what, I guess roughly three weeks before Memorial Day now, right? We have a whole summer to look forward to. By the time we get to November 27th, we will have already celebrated Thanksgiving. We're going to be wearing winter coats again. And the Ravens will have slapped the you-know-what out of the Steelers twice already. <laughs> you can count on that. You can count on that. And so I know it might seem like we have an awful lot of time to prepare for the new missile, but the fact of the matter is we really don't. We have an awful lot of work to do to get ready for the new missile. In fact, we have some catching up to do to prepare for this great gift that's coming to us. And so I want to begin tonight by talking very briefly about how not to prepare for the Roman missile. The one thing that we really don't want to do is to look at this task before us as one of having to memorize new words for Holy Mass. I think everybody here probably has a sense for that. That's not going to cut it for us. We don't want to just go to Mass to say words. What we really need to do is approach the text of Holy Mass with true humility. The kind of humility that it takes to recognize that we have a lot to learn. An awful lot to learn. And so what we want to do is approach the text of Holy Mass with the idea that we're going to scratch the surface a little bit and try to get our hands around where the words that we speak at Holy Mass come from and what is their deeper meaning. I like to tell groups like this that our real task, the bottom line, is to figure out a way to make the words of Holy Mass our very own. They need to be our words, too. 
And that means that we need to first take the words of Holy Mass to heart. And why is that important? Well, if you don't first take the words of the Mass to heart, you can't speak them from the heart. It's just common sense. So that's what we need to do. Now, all of that said, I would tell you that before we can even approach the text of Holy Mass directly, we really need to take a small step back to construct a solid foundation upon which our understanding of the Roman Missal and the things that are going on and what happens in Holy Mass may rest. So we can reorient our focus upon Christ, who is, of course, the centerpiece of Holy Mass, and to make sure that our feet are firmly planted in sacred tradition. Because then and only then are we going to be well prepared to receive the great gift that is coming our way in the new Missal. And so I hope to help you tonight to construct your own solid foundation for understanding what's going on, so that from there you can move forward into the actual text that is coming our way, okay? And we're going to build that foundation by starting with a brief look at the background on the Roman Missal. Nothing too extensive, but I think it's going to be helpful for you to have a little bit of a sense for how we moved from the first edition of the Roman Missal to the third edition that we now await in English, what kinds of changes took place between the various editions and why. I also want to talk to you about some matters of translation. How's the one that we're about to receive different? And I know you all want to know why. Are we making these changes in the first place? In other words, what's all the fuss about? We need to know that. And we want to ask the important question, how is the new translation going to help us to better participate in Holy Mass more deeply and in a more spiritual way? Now, any time that we talk about participation in Holy Mass, we also have to have a conversation about the very nature of Holy Mass. And this should make sense to us. Imagine, if you will, assembling with a bunch of your friends in somebody's house. And the card table is set up, and the cards are dealt, and the chips are out in front of your place, and you're asked to participate. Well, if you don't know the nature of the game, you can't really participate, can you? But you can go through the motions, and you can give the appearance of participation, but before you know it, you're going to be broke. And it's going to be a very little benefit to you. Now, don't misunderstand me, Holy Mass is no game, not even close, but the same principle applies. We can go to Holy Mass, we can participate on a surface level, we can go through the motions. We can even give the appearance of right participation, but unless we have a sense for the nature of Holy Mass, well, it's going to be a very little benefit to us. And we run a very real risk of spiritual bankruptcy. So we're going to talk about the nature of Holy Mass. What's going on there? Who's operating at Holy Mass? Who's cooperating at Holy Mass and how? And from there, we're going to wrap things up tonight with a closer look at fully conscious and active participation. This is a phrase that we've heard lots since the council closed. It wasn't invented in the 60s but it's something we've heard an awful lot about in the past 40 years. And so we want to take a look at active participation and try to get our hands around what Holy Mother Church means by that phrase. What did the Council Fathers mean when they set forth this agenda to promote active participation? And we're going to let Pope Benedict XVI help us with that because he's written some very beautiful and informative things for our benefit, okay? We have a lot to cover. It's going to be a whole lot of information coming to you in a short period of time. And I apologize for that, but that's the nature of the conversation we're having. And I want to forewarn you, when you leave, you're going to leave here wanting more. You are. And I think you've already figured out it's not because I'm so dynamic. That's not the case. But you're going to want more because the subject matter is that compelling. Holy Mass, according to the Council, is nothing less than the font from which all of the church's power flows. All of it. Every last bit. It is the summit toward which all of the church's activities are directed. All of them. It is indeed the centerpiece of our Catholic lives. And so when we talk about Holy Mass and we uh, enjoy mixing up what Holy Mother Church proposes for our belief concerning Holy Mass, it lights a fire in us. We can't help it. And I know you're going to have that fire enkindled inside of you tonight. You're going to want to know more. And you may want to revisit some of the things we talk about, too, so that you can contemplate them at your own pace and review some of these things. And I know that also you're going to want to move from here into the actual text that we're anticipating. Now, I didn't come here to sell you guys audio CDs, I promise you, but I did bring some with me. Uh, they're here, so let me know if you want one before you go. It goes into a lot more detail than I can tonight. And it also outlines all of the changes in the people's parts of the Mass as we're anticipating them this fall coming up, okay? Got a lot to cover, so let's get started now with that.